Okay, so I would like to welcome everyone for the ballerina track. So, uh, so throughout the day, we will be discussing about various aspects of ballerina, which is the new programming language that we have been working on. So in this session, uh, I would like to mainly focus on uh, ballerina from an enterprise architecture standpoint, how uh, ballerina fits into the microservices world and also the cloud native and serverless world. So let's get started with the session. Uh, so I would like to uh, walk you through some of the uh, uh, key aspect of uh, how enterprise architecture has evolved during the last couple of decades. Right. So to start with monolithic applications. So we used to build our software systems as a set of uh, applications. So these applications are uh, addressing a particular business domain, uh, set of business requirements. And uh, obviously these are monolithic applications. And in order to build a software system, these applications has to talk to each other. Right. And also they are sharing some kind of data using a shared database maybe. And these applications starts to talk to each other with point-to-point -point, uh, links. So these are communication mechanisms between these applications. So there are a lot of uh, protocols like proprietary protocols used in this uh, domain. And this architecture inherently comes, comes with a lot of limitations, right? So point-to-point -point integration style itself is a major limitation and the uh, heavyweight application is also a uh, major limitation. So, yeah. So with uh, with the introduction of service-oriented architecture and enterprise service bus, we try to eliminate some of the drawbacks in our previous uh, architecture. So what we have done here was, uh, so we introduce, uh, we basically segregate mon monolithic applications into services. Right. So these services, so now you have your systems of record and then you have your services layer. And these services are more or less deployed in a monolithic runtime. Right. In most cases that is an application server. And uh, once you have uh, all these services deployed into a, a monolithic application, you, when you have to build your business requirements or business functionalities, you often need to have some kind of a composition or some kind of a orchestration between these services. So that's where ESB came into the picture, right? So uh, from the ESP layer, you can build different types of composition and you expose those uh, composed or uh, virtual business functionalities to your consumers. So this architecture has been uh, quite popular and I guess some of you may have still using the same uh, type of an architecture. Okay, then uh, we moved into the API management world. So, uh, so on top of the same uh, architecture where we had services and ESP, so one of the key limitations in uh, ESP, uh, this architecture was the consumability of your services, right? So, so often when you create some kind of a business functionality, you need to expose that functionality to your uh, partners, to your customers, right? So in the world of uh, web services and SOA, what you often have to face was you have to expose your WSDLs, some kind of a proprietary or complex message formats to your uh, consumers. So with API management, what we are trying to solve is uh, you are trying to expose a complex service as a simple uh, interface. Basically, this layer is often known as the API facade layer, right? So you expose your complexity, uh, you basically hide your complexity and expose a simple business interface to your consumers. So that's where the API management came into the picture and became so popular. So this architecture is I guess most organizations having the very similar architecture even uh, nowadays. And uh, now with microservices, uh, the key fundamentals, yeah. So the key fundamentals for microservices architecture is to develop, uh, a s develop an application as a set of uh, fine-grained services. 
So these services, unlike SOA, these are fine-grained services, as well as they are developed, designed, developed, and deployed independently. So if we try to uh, apply the same concept into our previous uh, scenario, so what we will have is uh, we'll ha have set of uh, different types of uh, data and different type of uh, representations. And on top of that, you have a set of microservices, right? And on top, on top of that, you will have API management, which is exposed <coughs> to your uh, service consumers. So this architecture looks, uh, it looks like a pretty neat architecture, right? Compared to what we had with multiple layers, uh, with API management, ESP, and uh, application server. But uh, uh, as Paul said in the morning, uh, complexity cannot be eliminated, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes and say, uh, microservices architecture will eliminate your, most of your complexities of your system, uh, it may be not true because what you are really doing with the microservices architecture, in my opinion, is you are basically dispersing your complexity at ESP layer into different services. So let's have a look at how that is done with microservices when we are moving from ESP to microservices. Again, going back to the uh, ESP architecture, what we had in the ESP verse, we had a set of uh, coarse grained services, and on top of that, we had a set of virtual services. So these virtual services are doing kind of a, uh, they are doing two things. So ESP contains the business logic plus the network communication logic. So that includes, uh, so basically, uh, suppose that you have to create a virtual service out of service A and D. So the composition logic, the business logic resides in the virtual service one. At the same time, you have the network communication logic. So for example, you, let's say you have to call the service A in Brazilian manner. So that network communication logic also became uh, part of uh, virtual service one. So. So basically, in the ESP world, it was quite easy because we had all the ins infrastructure coming from the ESP, uh, all the resiliency mechanisms as well as uh, how easily you can create compositions, doing data mapping, etc., uh, being provided from the <coughs> ESP layer. Now, let's try to move this uh, use case into microservices, right? So what will happen was, uh, suppose that these are some sort of new microservices where you have to create different compositions out of that. So in, th in that case, uh, as you know, microservices architecture fosters uh, usage of uh, different technologies. So you can pick and choose whatever the language or whatever the technology that you prefer. So suppose that you have uh, three different microservices using, uh, built using three different technologies. So each and every uh, service will contain business logic plus the network communication logic. Right. So unlike ESP, now you have to deal with the resilient communication as well, as well as uh, the composition logic. So the, whatever the composition logic that you are building has to be uh, built from scratch. Right? Unlike ESP, you have to build entire composition logic from scratch as well as the network communication logic. So what we can see is the complexity that you had in the central ESP architecture is now dispersed uh, among these uh, microservices. Okay, so this is kind of a, uh, let's have a look at some of the popular microservices implementations and see uh, how they have implemented the very same architecture. So I would like to start with uh, Netflix. So uh, this is actually taken from one of their technical articles on their uh, Netflix API uh, implementation. So they had, uh, Netflix had a uh, uh, huge amount of microservices as the backend services. And when they have to build, when they have to expose an API to one of these uh, consumers, uh, the composition or the orchestration logic was built inside their uh, API layer, API gateway layer. 
right? So, uh, so basically, they build uh, API composition using uh, Rx Java and Java technologies. So the key idea behind that was, uh, so you'll have set of uh, fine grain or atomic services as your microservices layer. On top of that, you'll have some kind of business logic. Uh, built as composite or integration service. Okay, let's move into another use case. This is from Uber. So they also had a similar architecture. They had uh, so one of from one of their use cases, they had three different <coughs> services and an edge service, which is creating the composite out of these three, which is exposed to the consumers. So you can see that uh, microservices being built, but uh, when it comes to exposing the functionality, you need to have another layer on top of that. Very similar story with PayPal. They had uh, uh, the API facade layer, which contains the uh, composite or integration logic. And uh, one other aspect that we have observed in the Netflix architecture was uh, they had all these things built into a monolithic API gateway. So basically, what, uh, in my opinion, what they have done was, uh, they have built set of microservices, but entire composition or integration has been built as a monolithic uh, runtime, which is kind of the sort of renamed the ESP functionality as an API gateway. So this is kind of becoming very popular anti-pattern. So, so there are people who say we are using microservices, but uh, majority of their business logic resides at the API gateway layer. So, so with that, we we can uh, observe some of the key uh, uh, key types of microservices that we have to build. Right. So it is not uh, you cannot really say that you will build set of microservices and uh, you you'll have uh, smart endpoint and dump pipes and uh, you are done with your architecture. It is not that simple. So, uh, so if you look at the uh, different types of microservices, we can identify that not all microservices are similar. So there are services which are having huge amount of business logic uh, and also there are some services which are having a lot of network communications. And also some there can be services which needs to access some of your legacy system, for example, SAP, right, or file system or data, and uh, and some of these uh, and and the other aspect is most of your microservices are too fine grained to be exposed as an API. So that means you need to create some compositions out of that, and uh, only some set of your services are exposed as APIs too. So based on these. Uh, these observations, we can come up with a, uh, this kind of a organization for microservices. So, so at the bottom layer, you can identify these are like uh, the core services or atomic services, uh, which are serving a very specific business functionality. Uh, in most cases, those services will not be exposed to your consumers for the most parts. And on top of that, you'll have integration services or composite services which are uh, which may have some business logic as well as uh, a lot of communication or network interactions and on top of that you'll have your actual business functionalities or api services which are exposed to your consumers so in this case uh, although this is uh, represent as uh, these runtimes represented as independent runtimes uh, those things will be centrally governed for the most parts, like uh, application or enforcement of policies, moni monitoring and monetization is done at this layer. So those services are cons exposed to your consumers. So this and this categorization is not limited uh, to a layered architecture. If you are using something like a microservices graph, graph type of architecture, still that is applicable. So you'll have some services which which are core microservices, which are having more business logic, and there are some services which are having a lot of network interactions. And API services resides uh, right at the top. 
So this categorization really helps us to uh, uh, understand these uh, different types of services. So the core microservice development technologies, so obviously the, those services are uh, having a lot of computation and a lot of uh, business logic, uh, zero or minimum uh, internal service communication. And often most of the microservice development frameworks are addressing the requirement of core microservice development. It can be Spring Boot, MS4J or likewise. All these uh, frameworks are addressing core microservice development. So when it comes to building composite or integration microservices, uh, so we can uh, also identify API services as a, a subcategory of uh, integration microservices. So the uh, technologies that are available for building these uh, uh, composite or integration microservices, so as we have seen in our previous use cases from Netflix, Uber and uh, PayPal, they are using uh, Node, Java or Groovy uh, in, in their implementations. But uh, obviously these frameworks are not really designed or suitable or, com or they don't have suitable abstractions to build composite services. To give an example, uh, suppose that you have to build a, a network uh, communication, the resilient communication using some Java framework. So you have to go for a library like Hysfrix, you have to bring in that library into your uh, service code, as well as you have to deal with a lot of, uh, uh, basically developers, uh, the microservices developers will focus more on building their network interactions rather than focusing on your business logic. So, uh, and the other aspect is the compositions. When you have like, let's say, thousands of microservices and you build compositions out of that, it is really important to visualize uh, these interactions graphically. So having, not having the ability to visualize them graphically is also a major drawback. And also I, I've seen some ESB vendors trying to position ESB as a microservice composition development technology. Basically, uh, you'll have sort of microservices as your backend services, and on top of that, you'll run all those monolithic ESBs as a composite uh, runtime, which is again uh, uh, overkilling of the uh, most of the microservice fundamentals. And also, most of the uh, integration technologies or ESBs, they do have a lot of very high-level abstractions which are not really useful, uh, which are not really powerful enough to build uh, most of the modern uh, composite integration requirements. So to address the most of the complexities, most of the things that we had in uh, uh, these uh, architectures, so we came up with our own programming language, Ballerina. So the key motivation behind Ballerina is to build a uh, cloud native uh, low footprint programming language which is specialized for event driven parallel and uh, network related uh, communications. So the key idea behind Ballerina is to come up with a, uh, a programming language which is optimized for network interactions and we'll, we have the textual as well as the graphical representation. Uh, which is having the parity between both uh, representations. And also it comes with different types of network uh, protocol the support, uh, things like uh, HTTP, JMS file, HTTP2 WebSocket, etc. At the same time, native support for most of the message formats, uh, such as JSON, XML, and S SQL. And uh, since it's a programming language, you can apply most of the software development lifecycle principles like uh, CI, CD directly into the language. Also, there are a lot of concepts that are inbuilt, uh, things like packaging, things like uh, how to manage uh, different types of environmental variables, which are part of the language. And also, it is a cloud native uh, language. Uh, for example, if you build a Barina service, uh, it will start up within less than a uh, few milliseconds. 
So the, this is the graphical uh, representation uh, of ballerina which is based on a sequence diagram uh, and this is the textual representation and you can directly switch this view to a swagger view as well. So Asis will go into the details of ballerina uh, and uh, if you look at the feature set, uh, so, so our main objective is to provide high level abstractions for all the network communications while keeping most of the general purpose concepts like looping, variables, etc. Et in the language and we will have different uh, network communication uh, adapters as well as SAS integration adapters like Salesforce. And service definition will be mostly based on, so you can either use the service, so, uh, the contract first approach using Swagger or uh, in the future something like gRPC and also these uh, you can interchange between different representations. And uh, the container nativeness, so we, the pro transport is based on uh, uh, new transport implementation based on native which will be uh, extremely faster compared to what we have at the moment and uh, also this has native support for other container environments as well. So, so ballerina, uh, so we can go into the details as we proceed uh, throughout uh, today's uh, talks but the key uh, ideas or key motivations behind ballerina is to provide this as a technology to write integration or composite uh, microservices and also you can use this uh, to build API services at the same time you can write different integration scripts or this can be used as a shell script replacement which has which are having a lot of network communications and uh, so ballerina will be used as the tech as a technology in most of our next generation products including api manager uh, enterprise integrator in the future so so as a conclusion we can basically so we discuss how to eliminate the central is ESB from your uh, micro with the use of microservices architecture and you have to s choose different technologies for dif building different types of services and Ballerina is one of the as we believe one of the key technology to build uh, a proper pragmatic uh, microservices architecture. Okay, so with that I would like to conclude my session. Uh, any questions? Yeah. So, so, uh, so the question was on how to expose, uh, how to use Ballerina alongside uh, API Manager Two. So, uh, so only possibility is you can build a Ballerina service. So it will be exposed through HTTP, and you can, uh, as you expose any HTTP service, you can expose that through API Manager. So that is one possibility. Uh, but there is no way to build uh, or bring Ballerina runtime inside the API Manager Two. Yes, it's a different implementation. Yeah. Uh, it's been often questioned if we are running a subscription application. Uh, so, if I use Ballerina for now, does it also include this subscription mode as well, or can I use it without the subscription mode? Uh, so that depends on uh, how how quickly that you are planning to adopt Ballerina. So it, this is not still in GA. So probably we can have have a offline discussion on that. Yeah. So. Listening to that, yeah, it's a very clear strategic direction of WSO2 is effectively the ESB is dead or will be. So the query we have got, yeah, is given the fact that there might be some time before we get a stable production version of Ballerina, what are we supposed to do in the interim, yeah, in terms of our application where we need to ESB before such time that we may or may not move to Ballerina? Yeah. So, uh, so I'm not. I don't think uh, we can clearly say that ESB is a dead technology because uh, it all depends on. So there are, in my experience, there are customers who are still using ESB or centrally. So, 
So there are customers who are using central integration platform to build their business, right? So, and also asking them to move to microservices architecture itself is a major, uh, it's a major step, major architecture change from their point of view. So we will continue to evolve our existing ESP. So there are, in my opinion, there are two audiences audience which uh, a set of users who are addressing the central integration capabilities. So that's where our ESB and our next generation EI7 products fits into the picture as well as there is a, a growing community around people who are trying to convert their existing enterprise into microservices. So uh, we are basically addressing uh, both these audiences. At the moment, the central integration being addressed by Enterprise Integrator 6 or ESP. So there will be a new version of Enterprise Integrator which is based on Ballerina probably towards the end of uh, next year. Uh, so basically, we are not saying central integration is dead, but this is a technology for both of these domains in my opinion. Thank you. Um, if you compose multiple layers of microservices, um, isn't it harder to be resilient then in comparison if you just expose the, the fine granular services? Yeah, so uh, so if you have a composition, uh, obviously yes, there are will be more downstream services that you have, <coughs> you will add more latency and more, uh, uh, you have to concern more about resilient factors. Uh, so that is true, but in some cases, in, in cases where you really need to uh, worry about the asynchronous nature of the underlying services, rather than using synchronous mechanisms, you can always switch to asynchronous mechanisms. Uh, so basically, you, you don't have any synchronous communication between from top level to downstream services, but there will be asynchronous messaging, like uh, pub sub messaging and uh, business functionality will be built on top of that. Uh, so, uh, so we are planning to discuss some of those patterns in our microservices track. So you can find more details on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about the architectural principles now on, on the microservices, but are, are there any abstractions in the language itself uh, that addresses issues as service discovery, uh, load balancing, uh, uh, centralized logging, etc. All the other uh, problems that start arise when yeah. you adopt the architecture. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, language, as I said earlier, language has abstractions for most of the network and resilient communication, which Aziz and uh, the rest of the guys will go into the details. Uh, at the same time, it will have all the monitoring and all the observability things that Paul discussed in the morning, things like uh, uh, distributed tracing or open tracing. At the same time, discovering services from an uh, external registry like Eureka. So all those things will be uh, accessed, some sort of add-ons to the uh, Ballerina ecosystem. Was Ben, is it in fact using Netflix OSS? Sorry? Is it using Netflix OSS as an underlying technology there? Or? No, I mean, uh, as a registry, you can either use Eureka or uh, console or any other uh, implementation. Yeah. OK, so we'll wind up. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker. He is going to give an uh, introduction to Ballerina. So uh, our next speaker is Afkam uh, He's I think uh, he don't need any introduction, but he's one of the senior guys, most, if not the most senior guy who has been contributing to the WSO2 platform. So he's our senior director of platform architecture. Please welcome Afkam Masis.